is with uh, Wayne Green as his brother Donnie Green passed away this last week and, and Donnie's funeral was on Friday and also this morning we learned that Cheryl Royalty's mother Frances Cornelius passed away this morning in, in Florida. So our thoughts and prayers are, are with those families today. If you were here last week, you may recall that I warned you that today's topic is the seventh commandment, which is adultery. Um, I was trying to see if they'd let me preach on the nine commandments, but they wouldn't go for it. Said I had to do all 10 or not at all. So I advise parents that uh, while, of course, I'm not planning to be overly graphic today, but just by the nature of this discussion, there may be some uh, things that are mentioned or brought up that uh, might generate some questions that you don't think are, are it's the right time to, to discuss just yet. So feel free to utilize our nursery, our children's church. Uh, those things are going on right now and they would love to have your kids there. Uh, just use your own discretion for that. At the same time, I think that perhaps uh, in talking with some people in first service that this message might springboard uh, a much needed conversation with young people about things that sometimes we don't know how to bring up as parents. And so uh, again, utilize your own discretion as parents. Before we get into this weighty subject, though, can I tell a joke? I mean, please, let me tell a joke. Uh, how about a marriage joke? So a joke is told about a couple who had a, a troubled marriage, and so the man went to see a marriage therapist to get some advice, and the therapist told him some things he could do to try to be more considerate of his wife. So he, he wanted to apply those right away. So the next day he came home from work and he was dressed in his best suit. He had cologne on, he had flowers. And instead of just using his key to open the door, he rings the doorbell and waits for her to come to the door. And he's standing there with the flowers. He hands her the flowers. He leans in, gives her a kiss. And he says, honey, you look beautiful today. He said, just sit down and relax. He said, I'm going to fix supper tonight. You just go sit on the couch. He said, after supper, I'm going to run you a nice hot bath and you have the rest of the night to just relax and read that book you've been wanting to read. And uh, the wife doesn't say a word. She just starts crying. And he said, I don't, I, I don't understand. Why, why are you crying? She said, it's been the worst day. She said, little Johnny's been sick. He's been throwing up all day. I slipped in it once. She said, the dishwasher's broken. Your parents are coming over and the house is a mess. And to top it all off, you come home drunk, apparently. <laughs> and so ease into that if you're going to try that, okay? The verse with the, the seventh commandment in it is short and sweet and kind of right to the point. It just says in Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. And I've dreaded preaching on this commandment. Uh, for one thing, it's an awkward topic to talk about publicly. Okay. And if you think this discussion is awkward for you, try being up here with the lights shining on you. And I get to talk about this subject in front of my wife, my college age sons, my mother and my father, my former youth minister and his wife. And so all, a lot of people that have known me since I was this high, it's a little weird to talk about this topic today. So Let's just uh, get that out there from the beginning. Secondly, this is one of those topics that has a tendency to offend people. And the easy thing to do would be to just avoid this topic or kind of skirt some of these issues and, and, and avoid talking about some of the issues head on. But you guys know I can't do that. Uh, can't be cowardly. And my job as a preacher of the gospel is to preach the whole word of God, the parts that are, are soothing to the ear, the parts that make us feel warm and fuzzy, but also the parts that confront us and the parts that, that hit us in the face and say, this is sin. You need to, to wake up and get with the program. So we're going to do some of that today. And this, this whole series, you know, I continue to tell you, it's tough. You spend 10 weeks on the law, you're going to get beat up a little bit. And so it's never my intent to wound anyone with the word of God. And I hope that you know that. It's never personal. And my goal is to share the truth in love. And the hope is that when we know better, we'll do better. And my hope is that these truths will be received with a repentant heart. That's the only way to read the word of God is just with a repentant heart. And when we find something that doesn't match the way we're living, it's the way we're living that's got to change. And the repentant heart says, yes, Lord, I'll, I'll obey that to the best of my ability. I think there are, are two basic errors that we can make as a church when it comes to the whole topic of sexuality. Uh, we can, number one, err on the side of being too permissive. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we can err on the side of being too prudish about this topic. 
Uh, If we're too permissive, you know, adultery and sexual immorality have become so common in our culture today and shamefully among, among Christians as well as professing Christians that some churches fear addressing these topics because you're worried of who might be offended, who you might uh, run off. So our pulpits often remain silent on this topic while the, the church looks the other way and we just say, well, there's grace, 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 grace. We'll just continue to kind of follow these patterns and look the other way. But I think the other topic of the other mistake we can make sometimes is to be too prudish. Sometimes the church, I think, has been guilty of shying away from real talk about sexuality because we have the, this idea that it's irreverent to talk about such things in church. And we say that that's locker room talk. That doesn't belong in the pulpit, doesn't belong in the Sunday morning service. But the problem is the world is talking about it. Our kids are hearing about it. And because the church is silent and the world is talking about it through media and through uh, our entertainment and all the different forms of, of culture that we have around us, the world gets to define it. And for so long now, the church is silent and the world has been defining sexuality and we're in the shape that we're in today. And so that's on us because when you get into this book, you find out the Bible has plenty to say about sexuality. The Bible is not prudish about this topic. The Bible takes it head on. And I believe some people are living lives today that are sexually immoral. And at some point, I think we could say that's on the church because we've been too quiet. We've been afraid to talk about it. And so uh, some people honestly may not know better. And that's why I say when you know better and you have a repentant heart, you'll strive to do better. And that's my goal for us today. Um, So today we're going to talk about God's biblical design for sexuality. First of all, let's just be clear about what it is that we're talking about. Adultery is defined as physical intimacy between a married person and a person who's not his or her spouse. Surveys show that 22% of married men admit to having had an affair. 14% of married women say they have had an affair in their lifetime. And the numbers will fluctuate a little bit depending on which poll you look at, but that's kind of the ballpark. Uh, That seems like it's pretty reliable because most of the polls I looked at were similar. In the Old Testament, God didn't leave much ambiguity as to his feelings about this topic. If, If... And I'm thankful we're not under the Old Testament law because it says that adulterers were to be put to death in those days. Uh, Leviticus 20 verse 10, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Now, we're not under the law. We're not looking to kill anybody today. I'm thankful for God's grace and I want you to hear grace as much as you hear anything today. But even if you don't care, about honoring God by being faithful, consider God's warning about the personal consequences of sexual unfaithfulness. Proverbs 6 says this, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Down in verse 32, but a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself how many stories could we tell of of celebrity figures that we've known that have had a fall that they thought it was all going to be fine that they had it under control but everything came crashing down those engulfed in the exhilaration of a of a taboo relationship often are not thinking rationally and they're prone to taking risks that otherwise they would never take but they're not thinking as they they normally do. It never ceases to amaze me what people will risk for an illicit affair. Uh, Sexuality completely clouds the thought process. I was looking through some files this week and I found this story. I once read that the State Department of Natural Resources reported that more than 17,000 deer die each year after being struck by motorists on state highways. Just how many of you all have hit a deer with your car before? Okay. Did you eat it? I'm, no, I'm just kidding. But that's not the funny part. Okay. 17,000 deer die by being struck by cars. But according to state wildlife directors, the peak season for road kills is in late fall. Now, I bet there's some hunters in here that can explain why that is. The truth is that the bucks are in full rut, what they call it, and focus almost exclusively on reproductive activities and a lot less alert than they normally would be, so they get hit by cars. 
And, and the point is, we don't think rationally, right? When, when we are, are thinking along those lines, those caught up in the excitement of an affair often don't stop to think about what they stand to lose or what's at stake. Children that perhaps will get lost in the shuffle, a commitment that they made to their spouse and to their God, their reputation, the, the reaction of family and friends, all those things get pushed to the side. But you know, if you're here today, and I want you to hear this, please, please hear my heart on this. If you're here today and you've committed this sin of adultery in the past, I want you to know that God can and will forgive you. It's not the unpardonable sin, but we've got to say it today. It is sin. We can be assured that of God's forgiveness if we have a repentant heart, but we can't just brush it aside and say, well, everybody, you know, you just said, Greg, 20 something percent of men and 14% of women are doing this, but that's not our standard. First John chapter one, verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you know what you've got to do? You've got to confess it and say it is what it is. It's a sin. And we can't blame somebody else. We can't blame our spouse. We can't blame the stress we're under. We can't blame any of these things that we do to make ourselves feel better. We have to own it and say, I did that. That's called confession, owning what, you don't, what you've done. While you can be confident of God's forgiveness, realistically, there are no guarantees when it comes to your spouse giving you a second chance. I've seen it go both ways. I've seen truly repentant spouses forgiven by their betrayed spouse and then the marriage was restored and it ended up being a beautiful thing, but it causes so much pain. It takes so much time for the trust to be restored, but there is hope for marriages that have gone through this. But of course, some spouses choose not to continue the marriage and the Bible says that they have a right to make that choice as well. In Matthew 19, 9, it says, and I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. And when you read different scriptures, it gives that as the one clause where there is a, a different view of divorce. Uh, I hope that's not uh, where anyone is today or the path you've been down, but uh, there is healing and there is hope for marriages that have been through this. I want to broaden the circle a little bit today. And while we're on this topic, while we're all uncomfortable, let's just cover everything in this one week, okay? While we're on the topic of sexuality, I want to share what the Bible says about uh, sexuality before marriage as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the first two verses says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Verses 8 and 9, he says, To the unmarried and the widows, I, saw, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, Paul seems to be affirming that the proper context for this physical expression of intimacy is within the context of a, of a God-ordained marriage. And today, it's becoming so old-fashioned sounding. We sound so out of touch when we talk about words like abstinence. And when we talk about saving ourselves for marriage, people look at you like you have three heads or something. Like, what are you talking about? That's not even possible. Uh, how is that supposed to be a reasonable expectation? Uh, so the secular world just assumes that it's impossible and they stay focused on teaching our young people to make safe decisions, to, to, make, to make sure that they use birth control. And, and we tell them just to be smart about it. Listen, unfortunately, many professing Christians share that view. And we say, well, it's just impossible to obey that. And so we're, we're, we're going to talk about a different option. Listen to me. It's clear in God's word that abstinence until marriage, not safe sex, should be the expectation of Christian parents. We need to talk to our kids about our expectations. As awkward as it may be, uh, when they get to a certain age, this is a conversation, parents, that we need to have about what we expect. We need to talk to our kids about God's expectations and share scriptures with them, like the one that I just shared with you. We need to pray, pray, pray for our kids to make good decisions and to stand strong against these temptations. We need to help our kids 
set boundaries in their dating relationships. There are just certain settings, certain places, certain situations that we need to do everything we can to encourage our young people not to put themselves in. Uh, where they would logically anticipate that a particular temptation would be especially strong. That's what good Christian parenting is about, is setting those boundaries. And as they get older, encouraging them to make those same good choices on their own. Young people, you need to decide now what your boundaries are. Not when you're being pressured, not when you're in the heat of the moment or some sweet talking temptress or tempter is trying to persuade you otherwise. You need to pray and ask God to show you the boundaries that he would set in your life now. And I want to tell you this, it is possible to remain sexually pure until marriage. Even though the world laughs at the idea and tells you that it's not, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you, no temptation that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he'll also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We need to understand, biblically speaking, what exactly happens when you're sexually intimate with someone. God designed sex to, and he, he as the author of, and the inventor of that, he also designed it to be very pleasurable. If it's not dirty or it's not taboo, if it's enjoyed within the context of a marriage, rather it is a gift to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife. God could have thought of, of less pleasurable ways to, to have children and for, for the you know, society to continue. But beyond physical pleasure, there's something else that, that we need to see in Scripture that God also sees physical intimacy as a way of, of as the Bible says, being one with another person. There's a strong emotional element to it as well. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with the prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. And guys, the, the culture that we live in doesn't see this aspect of it at all. What God designed to be a beautiful union between a husband and a wife who've pledged their lives to one another in a holy union is often reduced to something fun to do on a weekend. Today's youth have terms like friends with benefits. That means that you have people in your life that, that you can share that with, but there's no relationship, there's no strings attached. It's just understood that you can get together for that purpose alone. The previous generation called such encounters one-night stands, if that helps you out. That's a term maybe you're more familiar with. But sexual intimacy, the world's way, has these brief moments of physical pleasure, unattached from all these other things, but it's followed by much longer periods of guilt, shame, regret, and turmoil that comes from it. Now listen, I know that this is a tough topic, and I know that because this is so prevalent in our culture today, that there are likely a number of folks right now, just statistically speaking, who are either mad at me right now as I'm talking, or you're arguing with me in your mind, and you're saying, but what about this? And Greg, you don't understand this. Or you're sitting there, and you feel about this big, and you feel as if I am talking right at you, and you're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, like I said about when we were talking about adultery, I want you to hear this. This is a sin, but it's a sin that God will forgive you for. I don't want anybody leaving today feeling beaten down, but I also don't want anybody to leave today feeling excused as if this doesn't apply to you and you're going to go on blatantly ignoring this. You know, a repentant heart desires to overcome temptation and obey God. It doesn't just say, well, I'm going to do it again next weekend, and then I'll just ask God to forgive me again. That's not the attitude with which a Christian is called to live. When I counsel couples who ask me to perform their wedding ceremony, knowing that what the statistics say about culture, we talk about purity in the physical part of, of the relationship. And uh, after I talk to them about God's expectations, I tell them I'm not the purity police. I'm not going to come and investigate what goes on, you know, uh, in your dating life and all of that. That's between you and the Lord. 
But I tell them this, when you come to me and when you want to have a church wedding, that says to me you're wanting God's blessing upon your, your marriage relationship. There are places you can go and get married by someone just to make it a legal union and have it all right with the state of Kentucky. But when you come to me, I assume we're asking for God's blessing to be upon it as well. And it just seems like an odd thing to say to God, to say, God, we're going to ignore your will for our relationship when it comes to sexual purity, but we still want you to bless our relationship. Something about that doesn't seem right. And perhaps there are some couples who, who need to have a conversation first with God as individuals, but then you need to come together as a couple and set some boundaries for the physical aspect of your relationship. And if you haven't kept your relationship pure to this point, listen, God can forgive for what is done. What is done is in the past. And God can cleanse you of that and forgive you of that. But now is the time to make some decisions. What am I going to do going forward? And, and, and express to God that you want to repent, that you want to seek God's forgiveness. And listen, I also believe that your relationship is not forever tarnished because of that. But God loves repentant hearts. And when we say, God, I want to I change things. I want to go differently from this point forward. I believe God can redeem relationships. I believe God can honor that and rebuild from this point forward. Listen, it's my desire to see God's blessing on every marriage, to see God's blessing on every dating relationship, every relationship, every home represented in this church. I want to see God bless it. But I also know that the, the greatest chance of being blessed and having that blessing in your life is when you are willing to repent and center yourself in God's will. And so that's why we're talking about these things. Not so I can just come in here and heap guilt and condemnation on you and make you feel bad. I want God to bless you. I really want that for you. But we've got to be willing to align ourselves with his will. And listen, many people will tell you God's path is the best path. God is not against fun. God's not even against pleasure. God just says, this is a gift, and I know how it works best, and there's wisdom behind it. And if you'll follow my path, you'll find it's a road to blessing. Secondly, or last of all, Jesus told us that adultery, this sin we're talking about today, it begins with lust. And just like he did with murder, if you were here last week, we talked about how he walked it back a little bit and said, no, wait. It doesn't actually, you didn't murder the moment that you killed them, but it actually began in your heart. We backed it up and we saw how anger is the beginning of it. And if you don't deal with that anger properly, it turns into bitterness. And then if you don't deal with that bitterness, then it can evolve into hatred. And when you get to the point you hate somebody, you can do all kinds of things you never thought you would do. Well, Jesus took adultery and he said something similar in Matthew chapter 5. He said it's a road of progression that begins in the heart. Watch what he says, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now listen, I, it's not uncommon to notice attractive people. I don't think that, that Jesus is saying if you've ever looked at someone and thought, man, they, they are pretty or they, he's handsome or whatever, that, that you have sinned, that, to notice that they have a pretty face or a, a, a good physique or whatever. But we get in trouble when we take mental snapshots and we fantasize and, and you take it to another level. And Satan can take those lustful thoughts and he will run with that and he will take you down a whole road of sexual immorality and it's a steep road. It, it progresses quickly. And listen, one of the main weapons in Satan's arsenal today is pornography. The addictive nature of pornography is well documented. The church doesn't talk about it and Satan is having a heyday with it. Just as a drug user eventually requires uh, stronger and stronger drugs to get the same effect, so it is with pornography. I once heard about an interview with Ted Bundy, who was a serial rapist and murderer, and he sat down as he was already on death row awaiting his execution, and he wouldn't grant anyone an interview except James Dobson from Focus on the Family. And with nothing to lose, no reason, I mean, if you can trust a serial killer, but he, he, he said, with nothing to lose, he said, I just want other people to know the path that led me here. He said, it started with pornography. And then I had to have something a little bit stronger, a little bit more shocking to get the same effect. And he, eventually, it got to where I had to start acting on some of those. 
and it just progressed and progressed until I became a monster. I became someone I never thought I would be. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that looks at pornography is going to be a serial killer. But listen, with the internet and streaming movies, pornography is now more accessible than ever before. And it's very, very addictive. I read this week, this, this blew me away. I read this week that 68% of Christian men view pornography on a regular basis. Almost 7 out of 10. And I tell you that to tell you that if you are struggling with this as a Christian, you're not alone. This is the sin that no one wants to talk about. But that doesn't excuse it. I'm not saying it's okay, everybody's doing it. I'm saying this is a big problem that the church needs to talk about. It's often not just a matter of saying, all right, well, I'm going to stop. Because it has an addictive nature to it. And I'm convinced that there are a lot of people who love Jesus but are struggling with pornography. And I I don't think that it doesn't mean necessarily that you're not a Christian unless you just say, I'm going to continue struggling with it. I think, again, it comes back to a repentant heart. What are you going to do with these problems? What are you going to do with these struggles? And I say, bring them to the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, help me be free from this. And so today, I just want to encourage you to make a decision today. I'm not okay with this. And I want to get freedom from this. I believe there are a lot of folks who love God but are in the midst of this battle right now. And as with all the sexual sins that we've addressed today, I want you to hear it, so I'll say it again. God can and will forgive you for this. God is not up in heaven taking notes and building a case trying to find a way to send you to hell. That's not the God I've come to tell you about today, but the God of the Bible is a redeemer. He is always looking. He loves so much that he sent his only son into this earth as sinful as it was that while we were living in the darkness of our sin, his son bled and died so that there could be a way from our sinfulness to his holiness. That's the God we serve. That's the God I want you to leave hearing about today. It starts with us making a choice that I confess that I have a problem and I want to be free, Jesus. Can you help me? And inviting the power of the Holy Spirit into your life. And praying and seeking help. And it's often a process. And and you're going to need some help. That's why I am looking now currently into resources to provide to our church family to help overcome this condition. I couldn't get that out of my mind this week. 68% of Christians are struggling with this. I want to see people set free. And I thought this week... You know, there are things in our life that hold us back. The Bible calls them spiritual strongholds that we, we want to be free from. There are things that when I became a Christian, I could just say, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I didn't do it anymore. But then there are things that you want to be free from, but you're still dragging around with you. These spiritual strongholds. And I wonder how much closer could we be to God in our relationship with him If we could get rid of some of these strongholds that are hanging around us and throw off the sin that hinders and and entangles us and live this life of freedom. Listen, the Carpenters Christian Church, hear this, is not here just to say this is a problem. Here's some some condemnation for, for being involved in this. I want you to hear my heart today. I'm saying this is a problem. How can we get free from this? How can we help people find freedom? This is not a place of shame. This is a place where we acknowledge sin and we fight it with everything that's within us. This is a hospital for sinners to come and find freedom, to find a path to a better way of living in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so today as I wrap up, I just wanna wanna pray along these lines that we've talked about today for everybody that that let's, let's, let's be in this fight. Let's be about this fight. But we're going to need a power bigger than us to take it on. Okay, let's pray. God, we come today and we just, we want to own whatever you've shown us today, God. If adultery is our sin, God, then we own it. Then that's what we have been. But, but by your grace, that's not who we're going to be going forward, God. I pray that, that the needed conviction perhaps has come and that those who may be involved in this or have been will just be resolute today in saying, not anymore. Not anymore. I want that out of my life and I want to be uh, wholeheartedly devoted to my spouse, wholeheartedly devoted to my God as holy and pure as he is.
Lord, maybe there are some that in their relationships, they're not remaining pure. And and God, we can't go back and change the past. Father, all we can do is own what we've done to this point. But God, we know that that temptation is so strong, especially it's being fueled by our culture. And, but God, we believe you when you say that no temptation uh, has come that is uncommon to man and that we always have the ability, if we'll look for it, to overcome a temptation. So God, help us to remain pure in our premarital relationships, Father. I pray for this generation coming up that's being told that it's impossible to stay pure. So why even try? Just just go the way of the world. But God, I pray that we'll be a people set apart and and pure and, and let the world mock. Let them ridicule, God. But we believe that your promises are there for a reason, that they bring life and that we'll see the benefits in our lifetime and certainly for eternity. God, I pray for those that are struggling with with the lust of the flesh and the heart and the eyes. God, I pray that you'll help us to to guard against those private sins that are just so easy to tolerate. And and God's statistics say that a lot of us are struggling with those. Whether it's pornography or whether it's just things on TV, we just don't need to be watching. We know it, but we just figure everybody's watching it. God, we know that what we set before our eyes finds its way into our heart. We want to be a people that are pure set apart and really genuinely devoted to you so help us find freedom God help us find freedom we need your Holy Spirit we need to feed the spirit so that we can starve the flesh God help us to to be honest just as we've talked about other topics Lord that whether it's depression or anxiety or some of these other things that we feel ashamed of God help us just to find freedom I pray that this will be a church where we can drop the mask and just say these are my scars can you help me Jesus, can you help me? And we can be real so that we'll find that freedom. Just let your spirit minister to people now, God, and give them a comfort. I pray that no one leaves today feeling beaten down, but they feel loved. That we acknowledge sin for what it is, but we're done with it. We're done with it. We want you more than we want that, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today, if you're here and you've never invited Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, Maybe somebody is here for the first Sunday. You've walked in and this is all new to you. And we were talking in my Sunday school class today. You might know this much about the Bible. And it might be what you need to know to be saved. If you know that you are a sinner. And if we haven't gotten anything else out of this series on the law. I think we've gotten that. We're not as good as we might have thought we were. I'm a sinner. And I needed a savior. And I can't do enough good to offset the bad that I've done. That's not how God works. God saw us in our sinful estate. He sent his son. He says he's the only one that can live this life perfectly. And he lived it perfectly. He did not deserve punishment. He willingly took our punishment on the cross. And if you'll put your faith and you'll come and you'll profess that I believe in Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God, and what he did on the cross is the payment for my sins. I'm willing to repent of my sins and I just want the rest of my days to follow after him. That's called repentance. And he asked that we identify with him by being baptized and having our past washed away, clean and pure. And he wants to raise up a brand new creation that's called baptism. And he wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And he says, I want to not just stand above you and tell you what to do. I want to come live inside you and empower you and help you do it. He won't leave you alone. He'll work in your life until the day you die. And then we'll live with him in glory. If you know that, that little bit of the Bible, you know everything you need to know to be saved. I pray that you'll come and just say yes. It'll be the best decision you ever made. Maybe you're here today and you made that choice a long time ago. But as the Holy Spirit often does, he shows us there's some work to be done. And you just want to rededicate your life. We're not going to judge you. This is not a place. If anybody condemns you, I'm going to talk with them, not you. This is a place where we come to drop our mask and say, I want to get better. If you want to rededicate your life, you come. We're going to pray for you. We'll hold you accountable. We'll help you all we can. But you come today with no shame. You come. If you have a prayer need, there's someone waiting right over there to my left. You go over there and find them. They'll pray with you and intercede with you for whatever burden you may be carrying. Just say yes to the Holy Spirit today as we stand together as we sing.